Hi everyone. In this video I will be demonstrating how you can use maximum likelihood factor analysis in SPSS in order to make a determination of the number of factors uh, that best explain the pattern of correlations among a set of measured variables. So the data set that we're going to be working with uh, is this one right here that you see on your screen and I'm going to include a link to it uh, underneath the video description so feel free to download a copy of it to follow along. And in this data set we've got um, a number of variables and basically these are um, these variables are reflecting individuals responses to a set of survey items. So the variables that we're going to be using in this particular demonstration are these right here where we have essentially two subscales from this um, from this measure I was using. So the first set of items are measuring anger uh, or dispositional anger if you will and then the second set of items are measuring anxiety and just so you know all the items have been scored in the direction where lower values indicate uh, lower levels of say anger or anxiety uh, and higher values indicate greater levels of anger or anxiety. So uh, the R uh, scripts that you see right here that's just indicating that these are uh, variables that had been reverse coded prior to us carrying out our analysis. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to begin just by going to the analyze button here and going down to dimension reduction and click on factor and I'm going to reset this and the first step basically what we're going to be doing is uh, going through a series of models uh, and I try to identify the model that has the best fit to the data and where you know adding additional factors is not going to result in any more substantial improvements in fit. So our first step is going to be to move our variables over to the variables box. So you can see uh, the first item right here, get angry easily, all the way down to our uh, rarely worry item, which is our last item associated with the anxiety measure. And just so you know, just to re reiterate that just because it says rarely worried, I've recoded that so that low means uh, low anxiety. Uh, high scores indicate or higher values indicate uh, greater levels of anxiety. So we're going to move this over to the variables box. We'll click on descriptives and then univariate descriptives and I'm not going to go into all everything else in this menu. I'm just going to keep this fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on continue. Uh, under extraction I'm going to click on method and maximum likelihood. So here what we have are a couple of options when it comes to extraction. So the first option that's available in SPSS is using uh, the old eigenvalue cutoff rule right here. And uh, in, in effect, these eigenvalues that are going to be generated right here are based on an unreduced um, correlation matrix. So it's not really uh, technically the most appropriate thing to be using uh, in this particular context with an exploratory factor analysis. It's really more apt. Uh, it would be more appropriate with a principal components analysis and even that's not um, really a, a much of a desirable approach to evaluating number of components um, as opposed to other uh, options. But nevertheless what we'll do is we're going to actually click on fixed number of factors, factors to extract. And so we're going to be going through a series of models uh, and evaluating a couple of indices of fit and then looking at changes in fit through a series of models where we're adding in more and more factors. So I'm going to start off with a one factor model right here. So I'm going to uh, type a one in this box and we'll click on uh, continue and actually before that I'll go ahead and click on a screen plot just to kind of visualize with the caveat that that scree plot is also based on the uh, the unreduced correlation matrix. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll just kind of use that for additional visualization purposes. So we'll click on continue right here. And I'm not going to really get into um, evaluation of uh, the factors or anything like that. But ordinarily, when you make a decision about your uh, factors or the number of factors or you consider or considering a fa certain number of factors you also want to look at the factors themselves to um, get a sense of the degree 
the degree to which they're interpretable. And usually we rotate our factor solution uh, prior to kind of trying to uh, make some sense from an interpretation standpoint. So for what I'm going to do right now is just go ahead and click on rotation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that in this video, just showing you that I'm going to go ahead and click on Promax rotation. This is an, a, an oblique rotation, basically allowing the factors to be correlated. And uh, what will be produced with that is both a pattern matrix and a structure matrix uh, for interpretation. So I'm going to click on continue and then on OK. And we can look at our output. So you can see, first off, we've got our sample size, which is the 464. This is based on a list-wise deletion. When we scroll down, we've got a box containing uh, communalities. The initial communalities and extraction communalities, these are basically um, giving a sense of the degree to which the factor model um, or, or the variation in each of our measured variables is accounted for by um, our factors. And so because we have only a single factor, you can see that uh, these commonality estimates, many of them are on the low side. So we'll scroll down. You can see that we've got uh, the extraction sum of squared loadings. Uh, the total, the eigenvalue for that one factor solution is right here, the 4.07, um, and so forth. And actually, there's no rotation because we had a single factor solution that we had requested. So um, just kind of ignore what I said earlier on that particular point. But we're going to scroll down and we're going to look at the goodness of fit test right here. And this is our first indicator of how well our factor model uh, may be fitting the data. So we have a chi-square goodness of fit test. And basically, higher values of chi-square are going to indicate worse fit relative to an exact model, if you will. So when we're uh, carrying out a goodness of fit test, um, it's basically uh, testing the degree to which our uh, factor model, in this case, uh, uh, pro produces a set of uh, implied correlations that exactly fit the population correlation matrix. So if this is significant, that's actually an indication of non-exact fit. Now one of the downsides of this type of test though is that it is impacted by sample size and so you can have uh, a situation where you have a large, a very large sample size and this test be significant, but yet the fit is actually pretty reasonable. So that's one of the limitations of this type of test. Actually, the two limitations are that it presumes exact fit, which is really fairly unlikely uh, to begin with. And then the other element to this is that um, it's also impacted by sample size. But we are going to use this uh, because we're going to generate another index to evaluate the fit of our models. So I'm going to double click in here and steal that value out of, out of um, my output. I could just type it in as well, but I'm going to copy this. Our degrees of freedom is 65. And what I've done is I've created a an Excel file uh, just for the purpose of this demonstration. So I'm going to put the chi-square value uh, for our one factor model uh, right here. The degrees of freedom was 65. Our sample size was 464. And you can see right here that we've got uh, our index, which is referred to as the RMSEA. So that's the root mean square error of approximation. And so oftentimes you'll see this in the context of structural equation modeling. And the RMSEA is just um, another index of model fit. And there are various rules of thumb for evaluating uh, the fit of, of your model. So values that would fall, say, uh, between 0 and 0 0.05 would be indicative of a close model fit. Values that fall uh, between, say, 0 0.05 and 0 0.08 would be considered indicative of an acceptable fitting model. And then values between, say, 0 0.08 and 0 0.1 would be considered uh, mediocre fit. And then values above 0 0.10 would be indicative of poor fit. So as you can see, I've just gone ahead and typed these in here so that you can kind of take a look at what I'm talking about. So again, 0 to 0 0.05 is considered close fit. Values up to about 0 0.08 basically 0.051 to 0.08 would be acceptable. Values from 0.081 to 0.10 would be marginal or mediocre fit. And then values that are greater than 0.10 would be indicative of poor fit. So if we use uh, this kind of uh, classification system right here, you can see that the RMSCA associated with our one factor model exhibits poor fit to the data. 
So given that, let's go back and run another model. And in this case, we're going to request two factors. So I'm going to go down to Analyze, Dimension Reduction, Factor, and we'll go back to Extraction right here. And we're going to request two factors and click on Continue. And because we did click on the rotation, now it actually is going to produce um, rotated matrices in the form of a pattern matrix and a structure matrix. So I'll click on OK now and we'll go ahead and scroll on down and you can see we have our goodness of fit test that's given and you can see the chi-square value is now 220.317 with 53 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to double click on here and steal that uh, chi-square value again and we'll go back to our Excel file and put that in. So our degrees of freedom again is 53. So I'm going to go in here and uh, put the chi-square value in and degrees of freedom right here and again I've already kind of created the um, the formulas for those so you can see in this case it turns out that I had a bit of an error with respect to the RMSEA uh, mainly because I didn't lock my sample size uh, cell so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that as well so my sample size uh, which was the 464. So now when I drag it, it should uh, give me a correct RMSEA value. So now you can see with the two-factor model, the RMSEA is now 0 0.08257. So clearly we have an improvement in fit as a result of um, adding a second factor. Now at this point, you're probably wondering how uh, we computed the RMSEA from uh, the chi-square and our degrees of freedom value. So I'm going to give you the formula for RMSEA and you know basically with that formula you should be able to set up your own Excel file. I'll, uh, I'll include a link to this Excel file underneath the video description but you can easily create your own in a, in a sim very similar fashion. Okay, so I've written out the formula uh, for you. Uh, I'm getting a little bit acquainted with a new pad uh, to write this stuff out, and so I didn't want to uh, uh, spend too much time on this video uh, writing. So at any rate, the formula for RMSEA that you see right here, we have the square root sign, and then we've got uh, in the numerator underneath the square root sign, we've got chi-square minus degrees of freedom. So that's this chi-square value minus degrees of freedom in the numerator and then we're dividing by uh, the degrees of freedom times the sample size minus one so again all of that is underneath the uh, square root sign and just keep in mind too that in those cases where the chi-square value is less than the degrees of freedom then uh, we're going to use the RMSEA value of zero now, in addition to determining whether we have um, a good fitting model with this second model, we want to also see it, how much the RMSEA has changed from model one to model two. And so, you know, if there's a substantial decrease in the R RMSEA, then that's going to be an indication that our model two would be a substantial improvement in fit relative to model one. So to do that, we can just easily, I'll go to the cell right here and I'll just uh, type in equals and I'm going to take the RMSEA right here for the first model and subtract the RMSEA for the second model. And so you can see that the difference in RMSEA values is 0 0.04872. So as you can see, what I've decided to do is just to go ahead and add this little note right here on the, ex the Excel file uh, where you see that um, RMSEA changes of 0 0.02 or greater would indicate a substantial change in fit from one model to another. And then values, uh, changes in RMSEA between say 0 0.01 and 0 0.019 might indicate more marginal levels of change. And this is based on uh, uh, the discussion by Fabregar and Wegner in their 2012 book on exploratory factor analysis. So clearly then uh, our RMSEA change that we have right here is indicating a substantial change between our one factor model and our two factor model. So now let's consider um, a third model where we add in a third factor. So we'll go to analyze dimension reduction again and factor and extraction and in this case we'll type in a three right here and then click on continue and then on OK 
and we'll look at our output. So again, here's our goodness of fit test. So now you can see the chi-square value has dropped to 128.575. We have 42 degrees of freedom. So again, I'm going to take this value and uh, we'll also take the 42 for the degrees of freedom and put those into our spreadsheet. And so in this case, uh, we let's see, we'll go ahead and uh, take these values and move them down here, so to the next line. And so now you can see that the RMSEA has dropped even further to 0 0.06672, and the uh, change in R square is now 0 0.01585, which using those uh, rules of thumb by Fabregas and Wegner, that would suggest uh, a marginal change in fit. Okay, and just for um, one more uh, example, we'll add one, another uh, factor to our model. Uh, so we'll go down to dimension reduction factor again, and we'll increase the number of factors to four. So we'll click on continue and then on OK and look at our, um, our goodness of fit. So now you can see it's down to 79.279 uh, roughly with 32 degrees of freedom. So I'll go ahead and put that uh, information in here and just so we can kind of take a look to see what happens. And so now you can see the RMSEA has dropped a little bit further to about a 0 0.056. So, and the change in R square, again, still pretty much fits into that marginal change, but it's, uh, there's not really much going on in that particular case. So at this point, uh, we've got four candidate models. We could probably continue on a little bit further, and, but we'd probably find that the uh, change in our RMSEA is going to be less than that marginal change. Um, at this point, we've got several candidate models. And so then we, what we need to do is to think about other uh, sources of information that might help us to sort of um, adjudicate among them in terms of which model may be doing the best job. So this is where perhaps you might uh, look at the scree plot uh, in order to evaluate, you know, uh, whether or not we have evidence of, you know, maybe a, a two-factor solution might be uh, a pretty good representation of the data or a three-factor solution. Just kind of keep in mind that in SPS that the uh, scree plot that is printed out uh, is based on the unreduced correlation matrix. So the eigenvalues that you see right here are essentially those eigenvalues that you see in the first column uh, in the output. And again, that's based on the unreduced correlation matrix. So um, it technically would be a better idea to utilize uh, the eigenvalues from a reduced correlation matrix and I show you a little bit about how you can do that in another video uh, on parallel analysis and you could also utilize something like parallel analysis as well uh, to help make a decision and then uh, finally just kind of mentioning that you can kind of scroll down and go through the factor solutions and look also at uh, your uh, rotated um, factor matrices. So here, for instance, for our, I believe this is our uh, two-factor solution, we'll scroll down. You can see that we've got a pattern matrix that's given and a structure matrix. So the structure matrix is basically containing the, uh, containing correlations between each of our measured variables and the factors. And so, um, so that's one way that you can evaluate or, or utilize um, the factor loadings to, to name the factors. But ideally, you would draw heavily on the pattern matrix. Uh, the pattern matrix um, is accounting for the fact that there's correlation. Because I've requested Promax rotation, the pattern matrix is uh, accounting for the correlation between the two factors. And say, for instance, with our two-factor solution, you can see the factor correlation matrix. The factors are actually correlating at 0.476. So what that means is that the structure matrix is not accounting for the correlation uh, between the factors and and what you'll oftentimes see then is uh, you know kind of similar loadings. It makes it a little bit hard to uh, uh, make a determination uh, between the the factors. Um, in this case, there there actually uh, not a whole lot of. Uh, similarities, but in some cases they can be quite similar. 
but the pattern matrix is part particularly important mainly because again uh, it gives you the association between each of the measured variables and the factors while accounting for the intercorrelation between uh, the factors. So these are analogous to uh, standardized regression coefficients in the context of a regression analysis. So just kind of looking at our pattern matrix for instance, let's just say I'm using a loading criteria of a 0 0.40. So in other words what I'm going to do is uh, assume that um, an, an item that loads at 0 0.40 or greater on a factor, I'm going to use that in naming the factor. So if we look at these anger items right here, I've just kind of arranged them all in this kind of way right here, you can see that they're all loading uh, pretty substantially on factor 2. You know, and you can see also that they have very low loadings on factor 1. When we look at the anxiety variables down here, you can see that by and large they're all loading uh, at 0.4 or above. The only uh, situation where that's not really occurring is this rarely worry which is loading at about a 0.320. So you can see in this case that the pattern matrix is suggesting uh, at least if I uh, decide to adopt a two-factor solution it would be suggesting factors of anger and anxiety. If we look at the structure matrix you can see uh, things get uh, are, are fairly similar but they also are a little bit uh, murkier because we're not accounting for that correlation between the two factors so these associations are not pure associations between the items and the factors so you can see right here for instance there's a pretty substantial cross loading uh, with respect to often feel overwhelmed with rage you know so you can see it's loading highly on both factor one and two and so it makes it a little bit trickier to uh, make a determination about which factor perhaps that uh, item should uh, be a part of. And um, so those are some things to kind of be thinking about uh, when you're looking at the structure matrix. It doesn't mean it's not useful, um, but you can use this in, in conjunction with the pattern matrix when it comes to naming the factors, but the pattern matrix would be the preferable one to work from. If we scroll down a little bit further and go to uh, the three-factor solution, you can see just kind of, again, looking at that scree plot, uh, despite the fact that this is using eigenvalues from the unrotated matrix, you can see definitely uh, right here, obviously the uh, one large, very large eigenvalue, a second very large eigenvalue, and then it kind of is leveling off at about, you know, three or four right here, particularly four and on, but perhaps uh, we might consider three a fairly trivial factor as well. So, Again, uh, if we were to stick with, say, a three-factor solution, then we would want to, you know, go down and interpret the pattern matrix and the structure matrix and so forth. But, um, you know, just kind of keep in mind that, you know, when you're running your analyses, it's not a bad idea to uh, consider several different options with respect to um, making decisions about the number of factors um, that would explain the correlations among your, your, uh, your variables. And uh, also be sure that you do check out your loading matrices to make sure that whatever uh, number of factors you choose, that they actually make sense from an interpretive standpoint. So uh, that is going to pretty well uh, wrap up this video demonstration, and I appreciate you watching.